gentleman up here who really needs no introduction, but for those of you new to the industry, uh, Carl Brothers uh, is a mechanical engineer who has been active in the Canadian wind energy industry for more than 25 years. For 20 years, Carl managed the Atlantic Wind Test Site, the predecessor of the Wind Energy Institute of Canada, where their focus was on small wind systems and wind diesel technology. In an effort to commercialize the wind diesel technology developed at AWTS, Carl formed Frontier Power Systems and built the Ramea Wind Diesel Project in Newfoundland, which we'll hear a little bit about this afternoon. So thanks, Carl. <laughs> Thank you. And I guess we will just move into this as the, uh, uh, as the crowd starts drifting back from coffee. Some of these sessions do tend to o run over a little bit, but really we're, this is a workshop, as people have said, and having this dialogue and discussion on, on what everybody has found out uh, is really tends to push the schedule around a little bit. As long as everybody leaves here uh, a little bit more informed and a little bit better connected than they arrived, I think whether we have coffee and time and get back on time is less important. Tito and I just had a brief, brief chat and we were discussing, him and I have been going to these wind diesel workshops for well, at least 20 years, maybe closer to 25. And it's really interesting, this time you see the, the breadth of knowledge and the level of discussion everywhere is something that uh, really is a testament to the growth of, of this small industry. So it's, uh, it's really encouraging to see after all these years that we're finally getting some critical mass. I was asked to give a presentation on the Ramia hydrogen project, but, but I'm not directly involved in that. So I'm going to speak very briefly on some of the activities in Canada that we've been involved in over the last, over the last while including the Ramia project, because there's two projects in Ramia, which is the source of the, uh, of, the, of, the pro, of the confusion. There's also two hydrogen projects in Canada. And I'm involved in one hydrogen and one of the Ramia projects, but not the Ramia hydrogen project. So uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about what we've been up to. This is a picture of, of the Ramia uh, wind diesel project that has been operating since 2004. And we put this up, uh, well, into, it's been now in, in its seventh year of operation, uh, still running well, still working with, Mer uh, with Newfoundland and Labrador Hydro. And uh, uh, we spend more time there than we like, but that's the nature of this wind diesel business. It's pretty, pretty hands-on. When we started the project, um, we were trying to kickstart and try to engage utilities in trying to accept the notion that wind might play a, a, a reasonable role in the supply of electricity to remote communities, and the response was, go away, it won't work. We've tried it before and it doesn't work. So when we were looking for a place to put our first wind diesel project, we selected Newfoundland because, partly because it was close to, relatively close to, to our base of operations at Prince Edward Island, and partly because it was a big utility with a lot of remote communities, and they were engaged in, in this prime power diesel users group in Canada. These are the group of utilities that really get together every 18 months or so, decide what works and what doesn't work. And up until that point, they said, wind doesn't work. So we wanted to demonstrate to them that the wind technology could be reliable, uh, that wind and diesel could be compatible, and the economics, under the right circumstances, could, could, could make the projects financeable. And then we wanted to, once we brought Newfoundland Labrador Hydro inside, we, the, the, tr the trick then was to go back into the prime power users group and say, we have a working model here. We think it should be deployed. So the result, um, we've been in operation since 2004, and I'd like to say there's been no problems, but there's been lots of problems. But we are, we are continuing to move forward. Um, and Newfoundland Labrador Hydro have become converts. They have now installed, in 2009, they installed three additional north wind wind turbines in the community. Um, as well as a hydrogen storage system, hydrogen generation and storage system. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that, but I'll talk more about the wind hydrogen project that we've been working on in Prince Edward Island. So I think one of the objectives, pretty well all of the objectives have been, have been done. Utilities now recognize that this is done right using reliable technologies and competent partners, this can work. So even in Canada, they're coming around. Um, the problem in Canada is that we don't have any sort of program deliverable programs yet that will actually ins incent the utilities to say, let's move forward with this technology. So this is just uh, a simple one line of what we've got in the diesel plant. When we first deal dealt with the utility, they were not very well willing partners. And they said, you guys get away as far away from us as you can, and you have to be prepared to 
shut yourselves off at a moment's notice for any reason whatsoever. So we, have to, we had to install our six windmatic wind turbines uh, with, with a control load, and we had to uh, take a signal from their diesel plant every two seconds or so, so we have a wireless connection with them. That wireless connection says, you may operate, you may operate, you may operate, you may not operate. And so as soon as they say you may not operate, we have to go offline. And any perturbation on the system, if we push the diesels too far down to the minimum load system, they say, come offline. So this load regulator is actually an export controller that we have to trim in order to uh, limit the amount of wind power we export into the system. We've used um, the rebuilt Danish technology. The uh, WM17S is commonly used in some of the Alaskan projects. We use a 15S, which is a 65 kilowatt turbine. And we, it's a standard old stone bridge of a Danish design from the mid-1980s that works well and it's reliable. Um, we, re we bought the turbines used, and me and my brothers rebuilt them and uh, drug them off to Newfoundland and put them up. And uh, why do we use them? Because we were extremely capital constrained. The only financing on this project was my personal savings, the mortgage in my house, and what I could squeeze out of some reluctant banks, as well as a, as a, a, a term loan from the, the federal government. So this was done on a pure economic basis, and we made it work. The all cost of these, this project with 400 kilowatts was about 1.3 million Canadian, which is about $3,500 a kilowatt. Now that's pretty, pretty attractive compared to some of the prices that we're seeing in some of the projects we're seeing, we're seeing now. And at that time, with the oil prices where they were, that's where I sense if we don't get install cost at around that level, we don't have an industry. And so that was really the focus. We looked at the newer technologies, drove the cost up, and I said, not only can I can't finance it, it's not going to work unless we get the cost down. There's a few things we learned, a lot of things we learned. This is a, um, there's been some talk earlier in the, uh, in the presentation, in, in, in the proceedings on let's just put one big wind turbine up rather than multiple small wind turbines. And here you can see uh, some data, some one hertz data taken from uh, five wind turbines operating. And you can see the variability on the five turbines ranging from 20 to 90 kilowatts. These things are rated at 65 kilowatts, but in cold weather they'll put up more than 65 kilowatts. That's a pretty messy scatter plot. But when you aggregate them at the top, it, it does a great deal to, to uh, smooth that out. But it's still not smooth. And so when you have a system running at 60 hertz, the diesel regulator simply has to, has to respond to that in reverse fashion. So whenever we first put these turbines on and we needed the diesel plant to talk it over the operator, he was looking at his diesel that had been rock solid for 20 years and now it's dancing around a little bit. Um, because this is real work. These diesels are finally doing the work. These governors are jumping around in order to regulate frequency. Voltage is not a problem. But if we had put um, a 650 kilo or, 200, or 390 kilowatt single turbine up there, I suspect we would have had problems with the stability. This shows in terms of one second variability in the turbine power um, in percentage terms. Each turbine varies. You, you routinely get 20% fluctuations in power, plus or minus 20%. Uh, and you can get excursions up to plus or minus 35% over a second. But when you aggregate them, you can see you get down to 5 to 10% variability. So this is a risk that you're going to deal with when you put a single large turbine in here. You have to be able to deal with that variability. So the operation results. This project has been talked about, I think, every wind diesel conference since 2004. So I haven't gone into any of the technical details of what's there. I think it's been talked about enough. So we've had 400 kilowatts on, of wind power operating on a 700 kilowatt system. And the diesel works. This notion that it's some kind of benign addition with the DC power and power is not the case. These, 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 these turbines will push this diesel system around. And these are 900, 900 kilowatt diesels. The, We've had voltage problems uh, during connection because we did not use soft starts. We've got around that problem, although we still don't use soft starts. We still use it across the line, but we're able to control the speeds more accurately. The fact that they're 900 kilowatt diesels with only a 65 kilowatt uh, generator is what allows us to do it. If we were doing that with a 300 kilowatt generator, we would never be able to do that with a loss across the line starters. The frequency stability is, is affected, but it's still within limits. Uh, whenever the turbines are not on, the these uh, 
these big cats just generate free, uh, sta very, very stable uh, frequency control, plus or minus 0.01 hertz. And when the turbines come on, it's plus or minus 0.1. Still not, not a problem, but it's noticeable on the frequency displays. Uh, we haven't saved as much fuel as we expected uh, because we rebuilt these turbines under pretty tight financial constraints and I, we learned a lot. Uh, if we, do, if we were to do it again, uh, we would have we done some, some th a lot of things differently. But we've had problems with reconditioned turbines. They're, up, they're, they're largely improved now. Um, we've, we're working in a community that was built, that was, the system was installed about 15 years ago whenever the community loads were up around 1,500 kilowatts um, and they had the, the 2,700 kilowatts of diesel capacity. But the salmon fishery on, or, I'm sorry, the cod fishery on the Atlantic coast of Canada has died. And so the facilities have, uh, have dropped, their loads have dropped. And so they, now we have big diesels and small loads, which means that when we're limited to 30% minimum load, during the summer we can't even inject any power into the system. And we were limited on our land base, which increased our land loss. But at the end of the day, the banks are still getting paid. And when they're paid, and then I can get the mortgage off my house. Um, there's two hydrogen projects, because this is the second, second point I want to talk about. Um, there is a wind, Ramia wind hydrogen project, which is carried up by Newfoundland Labrador Hydro. Two years ago, they installed three Northwind 100s, as well as an electrolyzer and some storage capacity as some hydrogen power gen sets. They're ru running a medium penetration system there, and the system is almost ready. They, they're still doing, they have, working out some commissioning bugs now. They expect to be operational in the near future, uh, operating in, in minimum, uh, medium penetration so that the diesels are never off. Frontier Power System was engaged in a completely separate project by the province of Prince Edward Island. And this is how things happen in Canada, and I'm sure it's similar here, where the Premier gets an idea. Let's build a hydrogen plant, a, a hydrogen village. And so the, the director of the Energy Corporation came to me, can you build us a hydrogen village? I says, what, what, what about, why would you want to do a hydrogen village? The Premier wants it. I said, well, I can build you a hydrogen village. That's not a problem. So this is our hydrogen village. But whether it's the proper technology to use, whether it's the proper investment, not, now, don't worry about that. That's a, the premier wants a hydrogen village. <laughs> so we built a hydrogen village. Um, it's a high penetration operation. So the intent here is to literally take the, take the diesels offline and run when you put ex uh, uh, extended, uh, um, when you have excessive wind power, just to run autonomously. And ultimately, that's where we want to be. We want to go into these communities and put enough wind power in there so that the the available amount of energy that we use far exceeds what the community requires. And stabilizing the grid is, prob is the problem. It's really stemmed by this question. Uh, we've, for years, barges have been heading into Canada's north, dropping off oil, and we have to ask a question. Canadians have made a decision that we want to remain in the north long term. The Arctic sovereignty is big to us. But the real question is, are tank farms going to be a part of the landscape in 30 and 50 years? And if not, why? Short, there's, it all comes down to energy storage, and we know that short-term energy storage can best be addressed by flywheels or batteries. This is a 65 kilowatt turbine operating over a 30 minute period, and you can see that the energy storage required for that, you only need, in order to take the highly variable output from a 65 kilowatt turbine uh, and convert it to a DC power over the one half period time. So that's straight line, if you want to average it out, you only need to inject and extract at most 20 kilowatts. And over the period of that half hour, you only need half a kilowatt hour of energy. So the power to energy requirements for short-term stabilization of wind when the wind is blowing is really not that high. When you get into the longer periods, when you're looking at uh, an hour, a monthly period of wind speeds, and this is a typical wind speed from a modest wind resource, your energy requirements and your power requirements for stabilize that energy increase dramatically. And when you get into the much larger size, range where you're saying we want to make a significant impact on the community load and the community energy, then your energy storage requirements are huge. So the project we have been trying to take for the next stage of the hydrogen project is a project in Nunavik called Cape Dorset, also selected politically. Uh, winds are not as good as I want them to be, but you work with what you've got. And similar to what Dennis had reported yesterday, only 23% of the fuel delivered to the community is used for electricity. The rest is used for heat, for, for motive power, and for 
uh, for jet. The, these actually, these communities are billed for the, for the fuel required to access their project. This, this uh, community takes about 25 gigawatt hours of electricity a year. And if you wanted to provide that with wind turbines, in the, in the upper um, case, we, the, our initial project is for 600 kilowatts of wind on a system that which would generate about 1,375 megawatt hours on a system that requires 5,900 megawatt hours. If we want to become very aggressive and provide enough electricity in the system, we would need 2,400 kilowatts of wind power. Of, so the, these energy storage issues are really what brings us back to hydrogen. Because when you look at the short-term storage, hydrogen doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It's flywheels and it's batteries. And when you're at the batteries, you're at right in the automotive sweet spot where automotive industry is, and they're developing technologies for that that we have no problem, no, no, no business playing with. That's, a, that's way over our heads. When you get into the longer days, longer term storage, in days, um, then the batteries, which is everybody talks so, high, so highly about, becomes a little bit uncertain because it's, it's so new and so revolutionary. And I tell you, for the last 25 years, there has been revolutionary, revolutions in battery technology that always seems to end up with lead acid being the old go-to guy at the end of the day. So all of these technologies that are creating so much excitement are not yet proven, and there may be some real issues with them in the long term. At the end of the day, if you're going to put large amounts of renewable energy into these remote communities, hydrogen is one of the options, despite its uh, drawbacks as round trip efficiency, that we may want to uh, we may want to consider. This is the uh, the hydrogen plant we've got in Prince Edward Island. So we have nominally uh, 300 kilowatts of wind turbines. We've had problems with some turbine reliability on at the Atlantic at the at the Wind Energy Institute of Canada, and we have about a 50 kilowatt load. So we have far more wind energy than we than we have for our for our electrical load system. So we can generate hydrogen. The wind is blowing, and you can't use to take the hydrogen through an electrolyzer compress it and store it, and then when the electrolyzer is not, uh, whenever the wind is not blowing, you take that, um, that hydrogen and convert it back to electricity. So the conversion to electricity, I'm sorry, from, to hydrogen is generally through electrolysis. There's a couple of technologies available. There's the bipolar units, which are m fairly modern. These are medium pressure systems that have fairly high efficiency, but they have no tolerance for load ramping. The older technologies, the unipolar technologies, are kind of the bulletproof design. They are slightly less efficient, but they're able to take very high load transients, and our intention here was to be able to actually use that as a dump load. And our, we have uh, we designed our power supply to be able to inject uh, currents at highly variable rates, and the electrolyzer was designed to take that. We found that the transfer function is not as quick as we would like it to be, or as we were told it would be. And there's a couple of new bipolar um, electrolyzers that are under development that may be able to take these high transients because one of the things with hydrogen, if you want to generate this hydrogen, you need to be able to change the load on it very quickly if you're going to be accompanying with wind. On the storage side, we have selected propane tanks, um, medium pressure storage. Uh, this is another area that's going to have to come a long way before we get, before we get, uh, get it practical for deploying these into remote communities. These tanks are big and heavy much like wind, uh, wind turbine towers. Reconverting it back to electricity is another area that is, is in flux. The fuel cells, the excitement 10 years ago of fuel cells, they're going to run our world, and then they kind of fell off with like the Proms Ballard power system. People had talked about that, and it never really came to pass. But they have resurged. There has been significant improvements in fuel cells in their economy and their efficiency and their lifetime, and, and they're particularly in their cold weather operation in the last few years, but they're still not there yet. And so when we were trying to talk about uh, an option to take this first pilot project into the north, we said fuel cells are too expensive, too, too unreliable, we can't afford that. The Newfoundland uh, project uses a spark ignition engine modified to burn hydrogen, simply by derating it. We decided that uh, spark ignition engines are probably not going to be acceptable to utilities. They only talk diesel. And so, and in fairness, automotive engines really don't have the robustness to, to uh, serve long term in these communities. So we looked at a biofuel technology using a conventional diesel. This doesn't allow you to get right out of the diesel, um, diesel system, but allows you to use the hydrogen that's generated. And we've been able to do some tests on a, uh, on a conventional hydrogen 
um, I'm sorry, conventional diesel engine, then we've got at mid loads about 50% fuel displacement. So our current thoughts on, on hydrogen, <coughs> there's, this is early days. And uh, this is not at the point where we're even talking about commercial deployment, but if we're going to get oil out of our remote communities, long-term energy storage is really something we need to start engaging in. So the, we don't even know if there is a technology pathway. When you look at the round trip efficiency of the hydrogen system, you, you're, you're down in the 20%, which is really pitiful, but it's not that pitiful when you consider that the existing diesel technology is in, is in the low 30s. So, it's, it's not, there is some compelling arguments that could be made if we can get the resources to continue this development. And so when, you, when we put a megawatt hour of diesel, of uh, hydrogen into, uh, into a, a diesel and displace that diesel fuel, it's displacing a megawatt hour of, of diesel electric, of diesel, uh, I'm sorry, of diesel fuel itself. So um, when I started this project, I wasn't a big fan because it just kind of came out of nowhere. But through it all, we realized that there is some possibility here and although it's really not commercial yet, um, there is some, prom some interesting uh, potential that I think can come down the road on it. This is a picture of our, of our hydrogen village, or a schematic of our hydrogen village with the, single, with the old unipolar um, electrolyzer. Low pressure system, it has a gas holder, compressors uh, to take it up to 250 uh, uh, PSI storage with, a, with our gen set there to convert it back to electricity. There it is at North Cape, and that's the electrolyzer. Somebody came in and said it looks like a World War II sub. <laughs> and the compressors. So the status now is that we are waiting for some turbines um, to come back on the line. Uh, we're ready to do our final field testing, and that's a March 31st deadline, so we're getting a little bit antsy about that. Uh, and we'll be carrying those tests through to the end of April to kind of define some benchmarks on, on what we found and what we can do and what our control system is able to do. And uh, we're hoping to move this forward. We've got applications in for a pilot project in, uh, in, uh, in the Northwest area, in Nunavut, I'm sorry, with Kulik Energy, who, su surprising to me, are really quite enthused about it. So we're hoping that we can take this forward, not as a commercial product, <clears throat> but at least as something furthering the technology to figure out how we get to these advanced energy systems. And there's a concept of, uh, of what the Cape Doorstep project will look like, fully containerized. The issue on the long term, on the, uh, on the energy storage is something that we're gonna have to do a little bit more work on. But it's a, it's a, it's an interesting project. And it's, I, I guess the point is that we don't have a pathway yet to get to where we wanna go. The work that we're doing here in these communities is all very important, but we're, we're still uh, a work in progress. Thank you. And with that, um, I think I think we're going to uh, just move on to the next speaker.